Hey, AP Physics C, this is Horner, and we're going to look at 2014 AP Physics C Mechanics Free Response Question number one. In an experiment, you have a student who takes a cart, pushes it against a spring, and then lets go, and then it accelerates its way through the photo gates. Uh, the photo gates are positioned every 20 centimeters so that the student can see how long it takes to get to the first one, then the time for the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Uh, when they do that, uh, when the spring is attached, uh, it produces a non-linear restoring force of magnitude. So they give you this equation, and S is the distance that the spring is compressed. So we know how much force it takes to, to push it back. Um, they want us to derive an expression for the potential energy of this spring as a compression, uh, as as a function of the compression S. So they want us to express our terms only in A, B, and S. So you're just gonna get an equation here. We know from before that potential energy is equal to, um, the uh, change of potential energy can be equal to work. And so let's think about work for just a second. Work, remember from our standard definition, is just force times distance. So if I plot force here and I put distance here, and let's say I have some sort of function like this, over a distance and I find the area on the inside, this area right here is equal to the work. And in calculus, when you find an area of a specific range, we know that we call that the integral. And it's uh, got this funny looking symbol here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that work is really just change of potential energy. And we're going to find out uh, using this expression what uh, the expression is that we can use in order to help us find this um, uh, U, the energy U, potential energy U is a function of that compression. So to do that, we're going to start first with uh, a function. So we're going to say the potential energy is equal to, and then uh, it is the integral of the force times that distance. Um, and we're going to look at it over a range. So that's our change in distance. Whenever we do this, uh, we've got a substitute in. Here is our F, okay? So we're going to say uh, US, so that's the potential energy of the spring, is equal to, now, because we're going from zero compression to a maximum compression, we're going to put a, uh, this is called an indefinite, indefinite integral when you don't have any, uh, any boundaries on each side. This is called a definite integral. So we're going from zero up to the maximum stretch. So we could find you know, the amount of potential energy at any position of stretch from zero all the way up to the maximum. And so we're going to evaluate it for the whole thing. So that's equal to uh, this. And then we're going to put in our, our F. Our F is actually this guy right here. So A, oops, I don't want to use S here. I actually want to use X. So AX squared plus BX. And we're going to evaluate that for dx. So we need to look at this equation and say, okay, what are we going to do in order to solve this integral? So it's pretty easy to do. Uh, we have a sum here, and so we can just add the integral of each one of these two uh, variables here. And essentially what you need to do is if you're not sure how to do that, there is an equation sheet. That equation sheet does have the formula for how to integrate this little function that we have here. So we're going to move over a little bit. You'll see this is our equation, x to the n. And so that's essentially what we have. We have ax squared. And then we're also going to do it again for bx. And notice that x to the n, all we do is we add 1 to the n, and then we take uh, 1 over n to uh, plus 1. You have to be really careful. You can't use negative 1 here. If you do, uh, you're going to get something pretty nasty, and you won't be able to solve it. So that's our equation. I'm going to move this back over a little bit. Um, I'm going to put that equation from the equation sheet up here. And so we know that uh, the integral, indefinite integral of xn to the uh, dx is equal to 1 over n plus 1, and then we've got x n plus 1 here, and we need to know that n cannot be equal to negative 1. That would give us a 0 in the denominator. That would be bad. Uh, so anyway, let's go through and do that for this whole thing. To start, we need to do it for the ax squared. 
So we're going to say uh, potential energy of the spring is equal to, now we're going to put a bracket on this side, and we're going to go ahead and put in our A and our X. Now, if you look at the equation, it's X to the N, so our N is 2, plus 1, so that would be AX cubed. But we also have to go back and say 1 over N plus 1. So we're going to do 1 over, and it would be 2 plus 1, which is 3. So that is uh, the first term that we have. Plus, now we're going to do BX. We have to do X for this one is N. So we're going to do uh, N plus 1. So that would be 1 plus 1 is 2. And then we're going to put 1 half in front of that. We don't need the DX anymore because we have integrated it. Uh, but we do need to make sure we put down our range, which is 0 to S. Okay. Now that we've done that, we need to find uh, any correct answer with a local minimum of x equals 0. So we're, uh, if we plug this in for 0, if we plug the whole in thing in for 0, obviously you're not going to get anything. So we can just do it for the s. So we're going to say the potential energy of the spring is equal to, and now we're going to do 1 third times a, and where we have x, we're going to replace it with s because that's our quote-unquote number, so this would be AS cubed, plus one-half of BS squared. Uh, a and B here are constants, and so are, are basically just the compression of the spring are these two numbers here. So that is worth two points, believe it or not. Uh, you get one point for doing this part here, and then you get one point for doing this part where you have... Uh, where you've gone through and done the uh, integral, and then you've solved it for uh, for the potential energy of the spring. So that is the first part. Let's go ahead and look at part B. We've got to remember what we did for part A because it's going to show up again here. Uh, it says in a preliminary experiment, the student pushes the cart. They give you the mass of the cart into the spring. It compresses the spring, so there's our S value. For the spring, A is 200 newtons per meter squared. So we know that this is the force constant, okay? This is another constant that would be similar to the force constant. Um, the cart is released from rest. Assume friction and air resistance are negligible, so you don't have to worry about it. They want us now to find the speed of the spring immediately after it loses contact. So basically what we have here is we have the car. We have the wall, here's the spring, and then we have the cart, and the cart has just let go. Uh, when it does that, we know that the potential energy here is equal to zero. So where did all that potential energy go? It went into kinetic energy. So our kinetic energy here is a maximum. So uh, to do this, let's think about conservation of mechanical energy. And we know that anytime I have uh, the spring energy, so my spring energy plus my kinetic energy, and this is the original, should be equal to the spring energy final plus the kinetic energy final. We know that we don't have any potential energy at the very end, and we know we don't have any kinetic energy at the beginning, so those are both zeros. So now we have an equation of just the potential energy of the spring should be equal, at the beginning, should be equal to the final kinetic energy. Uh, we solved for an equation for the potential energy of the spring. We said that it was one third a s cubed plus one half b s squared is equal to one half m v squared, where one half m v squared, of course, is your equation for um, kinetic energy. So now we need to solve this thing for v squared. I would solve it for v squared first get an answer, and then go ahead and uh, do the square root of both sides to get your final answer. So let's just solve this for v squared. If we solve it for v squared, we know that we've got to multiply both sides by 2 and divide both sides by m. So we're going to have uh, 2 times, and then we're going to have uh, 1 third, and this is going to be a s cubed plus 1 half b s squared, and then we're going to take everything and divide it by the mass. We need to substitute everything in now, so we have v squared is equal to 2 times, and now we have 1 third. Uh, the value for a we know is 200 newtons per meter squared, and our stretch, or compression I guess, is 0.04 cubed. We need to add to that uh, value 
one half of 150 newtons per meter and then we're going to take that times 0.04 and square it so that's our stretch and then we need to divide this whole thing by 0.3 kilograms when you do that you're going to end up with a v squared equal to 0.828 meters squared per second squared which is just the square of the velocity do the square root of both sides and you should end up with a speed just after it's released of 0.91 meters per second. Uh, for this one, you're going to get three points. One of the points comes from showing the conservation of energy. Uh, you're going to get one point for sh you know, just doing the, uh, the substitution of the potential energy of the spring using our integrated equation. Uh, and then the one half mv squared simply 4k and then they're going to give you one point for substituting any, everything incorrectly <clears throat> and so if you do basically I think if you do this step you would get all three points you really need to finish it though um, don't always assume that they're going to give that to you the next part of this wants to know what is the impulse given to the cart by the spring and I know we haven't talked about impulse since uh, the first year of physics but if you remember, impulse, very, very simply, is uh, the equation for impulse is on your equation sheet. But the, uh, the Im impulse really is just uh, very simple to do. It's just J, and I know they don't use I, but they use J for impulse is equal to the change in momentum. Uh, and remember, momentum is just mass times velocity. So mass doesn't change, but we could take our final velocity minus our original velocity. If you remember in the problem, the mass of this car is 0.3 kilograms, and then it's going 0.91 meters per second when it's released by the spring, and before it goes anywhere, it starts at zero. So this one's really pretty simple. It's just 0.27 kilograms times a meter per second. Uh, the other unit you could use is a Newton times a second. So that part's pretty easy. You get two points for doing that, one point for the equation, one point for substituting, getting an answer. For the next part, which is part C, they're going to have you graph, so it's always good whenever you have a graph, because those are usually pretty easy to do. It says on the axis below, plot the data points for the speed. Uh, this should be, instead of a U, it should be a V of the cart as a, fun uh, as a function of position X. Clear scale and label all your axes, do all that other good stuff. So what we're going to do here is we need to go ahead and set our axes. So we're going to say for the X axis, this is 0, 0. This is going to be 0 0.2, it's going to be 0 0.4, this is 0.6, this is 0.8, and then this is 1.0. Uh, this is position in meters. And then along the side, we're going to start at 0.325. We're going to do 0 0.350. We're going to do 0 0.375. We're going to do 0 0.4. And then we're going to do 0.425. Um, and this side obviously is going to be our speed in meters per second. So we have all of the data that we need here. Uh, we have both the position and we have the time. So we're just going to go through and plot. Uh, you should have one of your points right here. You should have another point about right here. Another point about right here. Another point about right here. And then finally your last point should be somewhere down in this area. Um, you get three points for doing this graph. And uh, those three points are pretty easy to get. Uh, as long as you've labeled both the axes, so I've labeled both the axes, you get a point. If you uh, scale your axes right, and we've done that right, and then you plot your points correctly. So that would be your three points for that part of the problem. The next thing that they want us to do in this problem, and I just got to scroll down a little bit here, it says compare the speed of the cart as measured by photogate 1 to the predicted value of the speed just after it loses contact. List a physical source of error that could account for the distance, so a difference. So obviously it's either going to be bigger or smaller. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is just tell is it bigger or smaller. So the measured, so we just need to say the measured initial speed is greater than the predicted value. And there's a lot of reasons why this could happen. Uh, the compression of the spring could be bigger than what was measured compression was larger than expected. Um, the table not level, so if the table was angled, so if the table 
is angled down. The, this is one way to do it. This is another way. If the ta table is angled down, uh, then the speed would be bigger. Um, the constants, so this is the last one, the constants for A and B um, are not accurate. Uh, you could put not accurate. And if they're not accurate, uh, if your true values are too big, then this would lead to a smaller potential energy, and then that cart would move too fast. So any of these three would probably be good for you to use. You just need to make sure that you, you kind of express them a little bit better than what I've done here. Um, really, for this one, if the compression was larger, then the speed's going to be bigger because you're going to have more energy. Uh, if the table's angled down, then there's going to be more acceleration due to gravitational potential energy converted into kinetic energy, and that gives you more speed. And then finally, if the constants A and B are too big, then you don't have as much energy, then the uh, predicted energy would be too small and your actual energy would be bigger. So you've got to give these a little bit more than what I've done here. Um, which is a good reason why you should listen to these. So very last part of this one says, from the measured speed values of the cart as it rolls down the track, give a physical, physical explanation for any trend that you observe. So here you see that the cart is slowing down actually. So the cart is slowing. And they want to know why. Um, there's just all kinds of different things you could say. You could say there's friction. Uh, um, and air resistance and that would make the car slow down uh, the track is not level so track is not level if it's not level it's probably angled up and if it's angled up when you know that extreme but when it goes up it slows down so those are uh, those are two good explanations you could use so you get one point for just saying the cart slows and then you get one point for going through and just saying that the friction and air resistance or that the track is not level and then expanding on those you'd have to say friction in the axles is high and there might be some air resistance that would slow the car down track is not level if it's angled up then the car has to fight the potential energy due to gravity so there's less kinetic energy and that's it.